Good evening, everyone. If you can please uh, stand up. I just want to welcome you to the second night of uh, one youth event. Uh, God has really done great things and has quite surprised us a little bit last night because a lot of us were uh, pretty stressed with some things. And then just God showed up and showed us that it's not about us. It doesn't matter how much we toil, it doesn't matter how much we prepare. At the end of the day, He's the one that can do it all. And I want to read just this, this a scripture from Matthew 7, um, from verse 7. It says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Actually, the, the correct translation there, the one who is seeking, keeps on seeking and keep on knocking. So it's a continuous, it's not just seeking once, it's a continuous seeking and knocking. And then it says in verse 9, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will, be, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those to those who ask him. And I want to say which, how many of us when we put the key in the ignition had faith that it'll start? Everybody had that expectancy, correct? Unless you drive a Chevy. No, I'm just kidding. Everybody had that hope that it's going to start. And I believe what God and what the Spirit of God is telling us tonight through his word is have the same expectations and even higher from me so let tonight the expect expectation be nothing less than a move of God it's not what we can do it's what he can do amen it's a uh, really interesting to look at the church yesterday it was like packed on the left and it was like nobody on the right side now it's like packed on the right side and a few people on the left so um I know the Lord's been pressing on my heart <clears throat> that we need a breakthrough tonight. Um, I'm going to share a few thoughts in, in a little while, but I want us to start with a song that says, Your power, your presence breaks strongholds, King of Heaven. When you speak, mountains move, and I believe there will be breakthrough. And I don't know how many of you came here expectant for a breakthrough or what kind of breakthrough, but I want to encourage you to just press in, in, in God's presence tonight. You know, don't, don't get uh, caught up if we, we're not perfect up here. We're doing our best, but we want just God to be glorified. So as you sing, as you lift your voice to heaven, just imagine God sitting here in the middle. Like, don't even look at us. Just imagine that God's sitting here receiving your praise. And sing with that kind of attitude and that kind of heart tonight. Amen? Amen.
break whatever strongholds are here. Come and break whatever strongholds are here. I don't know what it is. I don't know why this is pressing so heavy on my heart. But I pray, Jesus, that tonight any wall that is between any of the people in this place would break and will fall down, Jesus. And that you alone would be glorified. How will the world know that we are yours if we can't even get along with each other? Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come and just break down every wall every chain, Lord, every stronghold that's been built up over time because of difference of opinions or, or whatever it may be, Lord, that doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. You called us to love one another. And I pray, Jesus, that we would do just that. That tonight would be a, a moment of repentance. A moment of repentance when we come to you and say, Lord, break away. I let go if anybody heard me. If anybody mistreated me, if anybody spoke mean towards me, I let it go. I forgive. And if you've done that to somebody else, I, I pray that the Holy Spirit will convict you to, to fix it. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would move in this place. 
I pray that you would move in this place. Lord, if you're not here, we're wasting our time. But we know that you are. You promised us that you would. You promised us that you would. So I thank you, Jesus, for your presence in this place. Thank you for the change and the conviction that we are feeling in our hearts to fix things, to forgive, to love better, Lord. That we might truly be an example, a light to this world that is so dark, and is so full of hate, and is so full of division. Lord, you've called us, your church, to be united. You've called us, your church, to love one another, to be a light to this dark world, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. to the song that we originally wanted to start with um, that says our God is a lion he's the lion of Judah and this is from Revelations chapter 4 I believe it says he's roaring with power he's fighting our battles and that every knee will bow before him do you believe that tonight our God the lamb of God that died on the cross he is a lion and he's the one that fights our battles and I pray that tonight you would each encounter him, they would feel his presence in this place, and that you would not leave here without him touching you and transforming you and drawing you towards him tonight. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship. Sorry for my tears.
There's no one that can stand against our God Almighty. It doesn't matter what you're battling, what you're dealing with in your life, in your day to day. There's nothing greater than our God. And I just want to invite you guys to press into that tonight. Let's say, Jesus, this is what I'm dealing with. Be honest. Don't try to hide it. God knows everything already. And we serve a mighty God. So let's come to him in prayer and say, Lord, you see the struggles, the battles, the walls that I'm hitting my head against. Give me strength. Break through for me. Let's come in prayer for that.
that soul smooth for good and a lamb had conquered death and the dead was from their tomb and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the Father I restore come on church and the church of Christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth the bold shall not need and shall not fade by his blood and
returning. Do you believe that tonight? Come on. As he holds in this assurance, Spirit come, Spirit come, Spirit come, Spirit come, pour it out, let your love run over, here and now, let your glory fill this time, pour it out, let your love run over, here and now, let your glory fill this time. Come and fill us, come and fill us, come to fire, testify that the sun will desire. Spirit come, Spirit come, sing revival. Prophesy like in the sun, one desire. Spirit come, Spirit come, come to fire. Testify of the sun, one desire. Spirit come, Spirit come, sing revival. Prophesy like it is the one desire. Spirit come, Spirit come. Spirit come. Come from Spirit, Spirit come. Spirit Father, we thank you tonight for your presence in this place. We thank you, Lord God, for your presence. And we pray that we continue to usher your presence in this place tonight, Lord God. And let us find every heart willing to receive tonight in this place. Every broken spirit, Lord God, that needs lifting, Lord God, let us press on to you, Jesus, tonight. Let it be a merry moment and not a Martha moment right now in this place. Let us choose the better one tonight and lay at the feet of Jesus and stop worrying about the affairs of life. Lord God, even your word teaches us to not in get involved in civilian affair, but seek to please the commanding officer. Let us not be, let our thoughts not take away from that tonight, Jesus. Let us press on to you. Let us sit at your, at your feet tonight, Lord God. And let us receive from your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Every, I just want to welcome everyone, every past, I want to, Thank you, uh, Pastor Marius, for being here tonight with us. Thank you, Pastor Adi, for being here tonight with us. And if there's anybody I missed, may God bless you. May God uh, give you more fruit and more, more victory in the ministries that you're doing. And, um, yeah, get ready to receive, guys. Tonight we have uh, a Brother Robert with us tonight again, a dear friend of mine. And last night we saw how God used him in a mighty way. Um, this is just, don't get mad, don't get afraid, this is just how he preaches. Um, he's on fire. I can't pull that off. Um, but he can because he has that special anointing over his life. Uh, so get ready to receive, uh, open up your hearts, your minds, and just uh, press onto the Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Honored to be here tonight. Thank you so much for being in the house. 
If you have your Bible, let's go to the book of Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. I have never preached what I am about to preach, and I am excited. Um, There's a different kind of excitement. It's not the excitement of, of going to Disney. There's the anticipation that God is going to speak and that we're going to hear from him and lives are going to be changed. And so I sense that excitement within myself. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. Praise the Lord. I think sometimes we say, you know, uh, oh, I've heard pastors say not here, but in other lands far, far away, you know, uh, you know, it's it's good to be in God's house and it's better to be here than the hospital and it's better to be here than in jail. And that's not what my Bible says. My Bible says I'd rather be in the house of God than else, anywhere, even just a doorkeeper than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. So, you know, you may have had other places to be tonight, but nowhere better than the presence of God. Amen. There's no fall festival. There's no hayride. There's no corn maze. There's no pumpkin hunt. There's no pumpkin spice latte chill hangout flannel shopping at the Beth thrift store in the county better than being in the presence of God somebody please say amen praise God and if you're here on a date you brought her to the right place Acts 27 and verse 13 and when the south wind blew softly supposing that they had obtained their purpose loosing thence they sailed close by Crete just to give you context, Paul has been um, arrested and is going to, uh, going to trial at Rome. He has appealed unto Caesar, and they're taking him to Rome. Verse 14, and they're taking him by ship. He told them not to loose from the certain port that they were in, but they thought they had received fair weather, and so they, they, they set out. Not long after, there arose against them a, temp- a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon. And when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, we had much work to come by the boat, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest there should fall into the quicksand and strike sail. And so were driven. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out our, with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars and many days appeared, no and no small tempest lay on us. And all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after a long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and have not loosed from Crete. And to have gained this harm, and uh, and to have gained this this harm and loss, doesn't it feel so, some, good sometimes to say, "I told you so." <laughs> he said, "I told you we shouldn't have gone, but here we are." And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, "Fear not, Paul." For thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. And wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you this is not a bedtime story, not a fable, not a narrative, God. It is your living, breathing word, alive and active. Cause it, God, to do surgery on us. Cause it, Lord, to speak life into us tonight, to breathe power into us tonight for the days in which we live. God, let prophetic unction be in this house to speak to every heart and life. Single us out. Let every human in this building, Father, feel as though God was speaking directly to them if no one else was listening. And God, meet us in these altars, we pray, and God's people said amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I am from Florida. My whole life I have been from Florida. And... um, Florida is like right in the alley of hurricanes. So if hurricanes are going to go anywhere else, they're at least going to come by Florida or come through Florida. That's the, the hurricanes just like to make their pit stop on the way to other places in Florida. And when you grow up in uh, Hurricane Alley, you get used to uh, the reporters kind of like overhyping it. You know, they go to the very worst places and they say, this is going to be the worst storm there's ever been. And they're measuring the wind and they're telling you how fast it's going to come. You get used to it. 
and if you're like me and you've got a bunch of redneck cousins and uncles, um, you're not scared of storms. You just kind of go outside and sit in your lawn chair and watch the neighbor's trampoline fly by and, and uh, you know, you just know you've got clean up the next day. You get used to it. It's just something you do for entertainment. There's a storm coming. You have a party. You get your candles ready. You invite the neighbors, the church people, whatever. But then I went to Bible college in Missouri. And I remember my first month there, there was a siren that started going off. There are no sirens in Orlando. I never heard a citywide siren. First thought was, Jesus is coming back. And if you were the ways raised the way I was raised, I said, Jesus, forgive me for all my sins. I want to be ready if you're coming right now. I don't know if you learned how to pray a prayer of repentance real quick. I just wanted to make sure everything was under the blood. Amen. But after I heard that siren, somebody said, no, it's a tornado siren. Well, you can't, you can't predict tornadoes. You can predict the path of a hurricane. You can measure the speed of the wind. But a tornado, you don't know where it's coming from, how fast it's going to go, which direction it's going to turn. It drops out of nowhere. And so I'm, I'm scared. What are we going to do? Is there a bunker? Is there a place to hide? How do we respond to this? And they said, no, it's the first day of the month at noon. And every month on the first day of the month, they test all the tornado sirens. And so I just got used to it. It was no storm. It was just, it was just a test. And, and, and I never really did experience a tornado while I was in the Midwest, thank God. But, but a storm of, of, those, of those unpredictable natures, there's no way to prepare for it. There's no way to say, I mean, you can, you can create safe spaces, but when a storm comes, what do families do? They, they, go, they go, they find something to hide under. Maybe they take a mattress into the bathroom and they all get in the bathtub. I don't know how you and Anna and eight of your children are going to hide in one bathtub under a mattress. But, you, but you'll find a place for your tribe and your family to hide out through the storm, to weather the storm. I just try to pique your interest by, by telling you a story a bit to begin with, but, but now I just want to speak very clearly to you. There is a storm coming. There is a storm coming. I heard a few weeks ago, and I, I, I speak no ill of the, of the brother who shared these words, but someone was speaking of your forefathers that, that survived the storm of communism in Romania. And not just any communism. You know, that's, that's somewhat of an economic system and a political system. But on top of that, Romania had the, the severe oppression of Ceausescu's regime. And I can't imagine the storm that they faced. And that man of God sharing the story said, hard times create hard men. And, and those that, that came out of that with a strong worth ethic of survival came to the United States, many of them. And because of that work ethic, have created great businesses. You don't find many in the Romanian community that are complaining about capitalism. They're kind of enjoying it. You know, they run their own businesses. I was, I was watching something somebody was sharing today, and uh, I, I laughed because I know it to be true. If you pull up to a Romanian's house, they're going to have a white work van in the driveway. They, they have capitalized on, on, on an economy and have blessed their families through it. They're givers, they're servers, they're workers. And because hard people created through hard times work hard, they create easier times for their children. But then the easy times come for the next generation. And this man who is quoting from this thing that I've read and heard many times, easy time makes soft pe people, soft men, soft women. And then soft people make, make bad times. And the cycle continues. And hard, bad times, hard times, again, create hard people. And I just want to say this to you. I am not from your community. And yet I think that you probably have heard something like that as a pattern and a cycle in your ears for your entire life that you are soft and that your grandparents survived great hard things. And I'm not denying the story of your family lineage, but I am come to tell you, you're stronger than you think you are because God knew where to put everybody in the history of this world. He didn't put Adam and Eve on accident in the beginning. He planned that on purpose. He knew what would come, and yet they were there by design. What God said through Mordecai to Esther could be said of every generation. Don't you know that you're here for such a time as this? God knew where to put Abraham to start a family, where to put Joseph to preserve that family through famine, where to put Moses to deliver that family, where to put Joshua to lead that family into the promised land, where to put the judges, where to put uh, the, the prophets, the prophetesses, where to put the kings, 
generation by generation. Saul and David and Solomon and down through. I need an Elijah here. I need an Elisha here. In the middle of all time, he deposited Jesus Christ into the womb of Mary. Hallelujah. Amen. He was not out of time. He came in the fullness of time. Amen. Our liberal professors want to rewrite our textbooks and tell us that B.C. should be B.C.E. before the common era. And A.D. should be A.C.E. after the common era. Friend, you can change the initials to whatever you want, but if you don't change those numbers, when you dial back to zero, you're not going to find Buddha. You're not going to find Muhammad. You're not going to find Krishna. You're not going to find Confucius. You're going to find none other than Jesus Christ. God put him in time, right on time. God knew where to put the disciples. God knew where to put the reformers, Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Wesley, the revivalists, George uh, uh, Smith Wigglesworth, George Whitfield, where to put all of the great men and women of God throughout history. And through the end of time, in the wisdom of God's eternal mind, he knew there would be a hard time coming. And yet he did not choose others to stand in this day. He chose you. My Bible says that Paul writing to the Corinthians said that there's no temptation taking you but such as is common to man, but that in every temptation God has made a way of escape so that you will be able to bear. He will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able. Now listen to me. That means if you're going into a hard time, God has confidence that you can bear it because he will not tempt you more than you're able to bear. Others wouldn't be able to keep their mind and their sanity in this day, but God says if I put you here, he means I believe in you. Amen. You say I'm married, Robert and everybody else is getting divorced. If God put you in this generation, it means he has confidence that you can stay married. You can raise godly children. Others may experience a great falling away, but pastors, you go ahead and claim. Fathers, you claim. Families, you claim. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Others can claim there'll be a falling away. We're going to claim that on the last days, our sons and daughters will prophesy. Hallelujah. God put you in these days on purpose, and there is a storm coming and I don't think you're too weak for it I think God chose you right on time yes we have been raised in soft times America has not seen persecution in its history like much of Christendom much of Christianity has seen around the world and for most of the centuries and yet it's coming we've had so many prophets prophesying Trump is coming into power so many prophets prophesying good times all these things on the horizon, blessing and prosperity. I feel like Jehoshaphat when he went down to see Ahab and he said, but is there not a prophet of God in the land that will actually speak for the Lord? Where was the prophet that prophesied COVID? Don't come to me after and say your third cousin in Romania prophesied COVID. I don't care. I'm just saying I never heard of ones that said it. Where is the prophet that prophesied what the Bible says? In the last days there will be perilous times. In the last day, there will be false prophets. In the last days, there will be those misrepresenting Christ. Where are those that understand, amen, everybody's not going to drive an Escalade. Everybody's not going to have perfect, a perfect life. And yet, that does not mean anything ill of us. It means that God chose us on purpose. All the disciples but John, they were martyred. This is not the Bible says it, but history records by tradition. They were martyred. Why would we be counted any less than them? Jesus says the disciple is not above his master. Amen. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. There is a storm coming. And you can respond to a storm in multiple ways. You can go into hiding. You can begin to see the things happening on the horizon of this world. And just, just hide behind, I'm not talking about a COVID mask, I'm talking about the mask of your own persona, building up a front, try, trying to fit into a, a social gathering and saying, this is just who I am. I preached on that last night. You don't even know who you are until you're, you're, you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, until you're surrendered to the plan of God for your life. I've seen people that thought they were timid and shy and backward and quiet. God filled them with the Holy Ghost and fire, and now they're on the front row worshiping their brains out, loving Jesus in the midst of everybody, not quiet. Why? Because that wasn't their personality. It was God's design for them when God filled them. There's another season 
coming. It's undeniable. The word says it's on the horizon. And you can either go into a place of hiding. What does that mean? I think that, I think that I'm around young people enough to see there's a group of young people that when uh, something aggressive happens to them, this is their, this is their response. Chill out. <laughs> Leave me alone. It's not that big a deal. I think I've seen especially young men who, whose parents have harped on them for years. Mothers have yelled at them for years. All of a sudden, raising a voice is no longer an increased intensity if it's always raised in your home. It's just the common sound of your home. And you go to school and somebody's yelling at you and it doesn't affect you. And you get on the field and your coach yells at you and it doesn't affect you. And you turn on the news and the, and the casters are speaking back and forth, yelling about politics, and it doesn't affect you. And you come to church and somebody tries to speak for God and they say, God has more for you. God has a plan for you. God is calling you. And your same response is, chill out. It's not that big of a deal. You have hidden in a dark place. You have surrounded yourself with the comfort of your own personality to say, I will numb my emotions because there's always been a storm in my life and you can't do anything in these last days for God hiding in the dark under the mattress of your own emotional chill. I don't know if there's many in this, in this community, but, but maybe there's a response that seems to be happening more and more in our country where people are saying, well, I just need to be me. And so we've somehow associated the opposite of chill, and that is lashing out, that is giving people a piece of our mind, that is road rage, that is being a Karen for customer service people, I need to speak to your manage, that is somebody constantly raging against the storm. If you're going to come at me with a storm, I'm going to come at you with a storm. And somehow that's their response. And in this day, God has called us to something different. We are no longer in the Garden of Eden. We are no longer in the peaceful atmosphere for which we are created. We are now chosen to live in the tempest of this time. Hallelujah. We're not going to make it back to Eden in our day. And yet God says something of the Holy Ghost. He says it in two epistles. He said he is the earnest of our inheritance. He is the down payment on our inheritance. If you go to the bank and you say, I'm going to try to take out a loan for $100,000, if you qualify for that loan, they're going to ask for a down payment. You either have to sign with some collateral to say, well, put down my land, put down uh, something that I own, or you're going to have to pay a certain percent up front. You're borrowing $100,000, but maybe you have to put down $3,000. They're wanting to know up front, how can you guarantee that you're good to pay the rest of it. And you say this, I'll make a down payment. That's called an earnest. I will give you a little bit to prove to you the rest is on its way. And Paul, understanding that concept, says to two churches, how do we know heaven is real? How do we know God is going to bring back something greater than Eden, but eternal, everlasting life, streets of gold, jasper walls, gates of pearl, where Christ Jesus will be the light of that city? How do we know it's really going to happen? And Paul says, because though you may be left, I'm not cursing, I'm telling you the reality, though you may be left in hell on earth while you're here, we don't ask God to change the condition. Don't ask God to change all the politics. Don't make all of your focus on making this the garden of Eden. No, say God fill me with a down payment of heaven now. So you may go to school and there may be hell in your school. There may be hell on your job. You may have hell in the atmosphere of your home and yet you can say God fill me with the deposit of heaven whereby I can live in the storm and be filled with the abiding peace of God. And he says the Holy Spirit is that earnest. The Holy Ghost is that down payment. How do I know heaven's real? Because he already made a deposit of it in my life. Some of you will be going home tonight to the struggle of your life. The psalmist said like this, the nation that forgets God shall be turned into hell. And that, that, that Hebrew phrase turned into is the same one that Samuel used when he said of Saul, when you leave me, you'll come by, you'll come by a certain city and when you go there, the company of the prophets will come out and the spirit of God will come on you and you will be turned into another man. The nation that forgets God shall be turned into hell. It means there's a metamorphosis happening. It means that the culture is turning into hell. The media is turning into hell. Are you aware that we're getting closer to judgment day, closer to, to eternity? And if that's true of the world, no wonder their anxiety is increasing. They're getting closer to their end. 
They're getting closer to their demise. No wonder darkness is more rampant. No, one, no wonder sin is climaxing in our day because they're getting closer to an eternity of wrath without the benefit of the grace of God. If they're getting closer to their eternal end, then it will manifest itself with more demon-possessed people, more hatred, the love of many waxing cold. Come on, all these things are going to happen before their latter end. But what about us? If they're getting closer to their antichrist coming to rule and reign, and then we ought to be knowing something more of the grace of being closer to King Jesus returning for us. A hundred years ago, the church sang almost nothing but hymns. And hymns are wonderful. I've memorized many of them. I sing them going down the road. I love them. But many of them are doctrine-based. They were meant to teach doctrine by repetition. Immortal, invincible, God-only wise. That's a mouthful of doctrine put to the lyrics, uh, to, 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 the, to the melody of a song. But our songs in our generation are being written, Sister Valerie, in another way. They're being written as a love song to Jesus. Why? Because the bride, the, the church is about to see her bridegroom. If they're getting closer to their end and their nature is being turned into hell that is their eternity, then the last day church, I feel the Holy Ghost right now, the last day church ought to be getting closer to our eternity. Amen. When you get close to the end of making that full payment on a loan, you're no longer with a down, the down payment. You're about 90% done with what's about to be fully paid back. Amen. The, the world may be experiencing hell like never before, divorce like never before, abortion like never before hatred malice prejudice domestic violence all kind of abuse but the church ought to be experiencing glory and revival and divine healing and deliverance and freedom and victory why because we're getting closer to our final payment of seeing king jesus there's a storm coming but friend i've got good news for you we were born in the storm we may be seeing a storm in the last days, but it is nothing but the completion of the cycle in which the church was born. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place, in one mind, in one accord. And suddenly, you've heard it so often, you could quote it with me, but would you just come to it fresh tonight? And suddenly, not gradually, but climactically, there came a sound as of a tornado. There came a sound as of a rushing, mighty wind. And when this sound filled their ears, and now they're piqued with interest, where did that come from? What is that? Now a swirling ball of fire appeared in the center of the room, and as soon as it appeared, it divided with cloven tongues upon each one of their heads. A flame, a wind. Two chapters later in Acts 4, they're praying, and an earthquake comes, not to the city, to the building that they're praying in. Amen. They were born in the storm of God's presence moving in their midst, but they were born in the storm of political upheaval. They've got Rome against them. They've got politics against them. They've got religion of the Jews against them. They've got when they go to begin to preach in all of these Gentile cities, they've got the witchcraft of the day. Amen. They threw them in the Philippian jail because they cast the devil out of that soothsaying, uh, that, that, that fortune-telling woman. They are in a storm of adversity. We've got good news tonight. How are we going to survive in the storm that's coming, Brother Robert? By looking right back into the book of Acts and finding that our brothers and sisters in Christ, they survived through the storm that they were encountering by the same Holy Ghost you and I have. Hear me tonight, friend. If you get filled with the Holy Ghost at the age of 12, you don't get a junior Holy Ghost. You don't get a middle school Holy Ghost. There's only one Holy Ghost, and it's the same one that Peter, James, and John got on the day of Pentecost. Our brother's in seminary. Is it a Methodist seminary? Yeah, affiliated or some sort, connected. And he's, he's, he's taken a course this, uh, tell me your name again. Brother Tory is uh, taking a course this, this year in the sermons of John Wesley. I'm a little envious. I think that's awesome. John Wesley had graduated from Oxford University. I might have to tag you and you preach this portion. I don't know. 
Just don't, don't, don't beat me up too bad if I'm really wrong. I, I, I researched it the best I could. John Wesley, the son of an Anglican priest, goes to Oxford University, graduates with his ministerial credentials, his, his license, him and his brother Charles feel called to go and be missionaries to the Native Americans in, in the far-flung corner of the mission field called Georgia. And then they get on the boat, and they're going to be missionaries. They meet up on the boat with another group of missionaries that are from Germany, from a group of Christians called Moravians. Moravians had, had already been a, a people of holiness, and that day they were called pietists. So they turned away from alcohol. They turned away from ungodly entertainment in their day. They pre preached against going to the dance halls, preached against going to worldly theaters, and they were people of prayer. There was a certain prayer meeting in the, in, the, in the land that Count Zinzendorf had that had gone on for a hundred years, a hundred years of an unbroken prayer meeting, somebody always in that prayer hall praying around the clock from their fellowship. Two men in that fellowship had heard that there was an island in the Caribbean on which the, the slave owner would not allow any missionaries to come. Those two Moravian German men said if the only way we can take the gospel there is to go by as slaves, then they said so be it. We don't have money even to buy a ticket to get there, so we'll sell ourselves into slavery, and with the revenue of selling ourselves, we'll buy the ticket to pay the way to take us to go be slaves on that island for the purpose of being missionaries. If you've heard the story, you know what I'm about to say. As they stood arm and shoulder, shoulder and arm on the bow of that boat, and their families wept as they were being, not coming back every four years on furlough, not going for three weeks and coming back for a visit. No, being gone for the rest of their life, their families weeping. They didn't say pray for us. They didn't say send us cookies at Christmas. They didn't say any of those things. This was the cry of the first Moravian missionary movement. They said this, probably in German, as their, as their, as their boat was disembarking, they said, may the Lamb of God receive the reward of his suffering. <sighs> Going to be slaves in the Caribbean just to share the gospel with souls that they thought were worthy to hear of Christ. They said, may the Lamb of God receive the reward of his suffering. That cry went throughout the Moravian movement. They are the forefathers of modern missions amongst all Protestant denominations. And so now another group of them years later is going to the Americas. And as they're crossing from England over to Georgia, John, becomes very, uh, John Wesley becomes very acquainted with this group. He had learned enough German that he could converse with them. He could sing with them. He could pray with them. He began to have communion with them. And one day as they're crossing through the ocean, a great storm came. As it's crashing against them, the Moravians are having a prayer meeting and are singing their hymns in German. One massive wave came and completely engulfed the entire ship. And John Wesley recorded in his journal at that moment, all the Englishmen across the ship, even seasoned sailors who had lived at sea, they yelled, they screamed as terror filled the ship. But the Moravians never broke the cadence of their song. And he interviewed them later. They, he said, weren't you afraid? None of you cried out, not even your children, not even your babies. And they said, why would we be afraid? Our life is hidden Christ. If he takes us, we are at peace. If he leaves us, we have a call on our life. He realized at that moment, think about this. Raised in a pastor's home, can quote scripture in multiple languages, a graduate of university, as ordained in the ministry. And he realized at that moment he was not born again. He goes to be a missionary and is a miserable failure. He dates, courts a young lady and has, a, has a, a heartbroken situation there and finally is forced to come back to England. The bishop, the Moravian bishop in Germany kept asking him while he was there, do you have the witness of the spirit to confirm that you are a child of God? Not the confirmation of the Anglican church. Not your parents that made you quote scripture. Do you have the witness of the spirit that you're a child of God? And John Wesley could never say anything. He was convinced in the storm that what the Moravians had, he had not yet experienced. He had all the doctrine. He had all the scriptures. He had all the songs. He had been raised in church. But he did not know the abiding peace of God that survives in the storm. Woo! Glory to God. 
Y'all don't feel like preaching with me. I'm going to preach like I've got liberty anyways. Hallelujah. Amen. There's a storm coming, and I, I, I don't know if you've ever seen some of those movies where it starts with some crazy scientist that's got this, like, conspiracy theory, and all the other people that are his, uh, his like, people he went to school with and worked with, they all ostracize the scientists, and they say, you're weird, you're crazy, because you believe in asteroids, or you believe in dinosaurs, whatever they think he's crazy for, and then... The asteroid starts coming, <laughs> and then Jurassic World, they like resurrect the dinosaur, whatever. What, who do they call? They call the crazy conspiracy theorist scientist. You know what believers in this last day ought to be? We ought to be the ones announcing the storm, announcing that Christ is coming, announcing that you can have peace through the midst of any circumstance. And while people brush you off at school and your friends say you're too fanatical, you're too crazy, friend, who are they going to call when it all starts transpiring? Amen. They're going to say, you told us this was happening, and you can be just like Paul on the bow of that ship and said, I told you the storm was coming coming. John Wesley goes back to England, is invited to a German-speaking Moravian church at Aldersgate. I love this story because it's in England, and it's a group of immigrants having church in their native language, Pastor Adi. And while they were reading the preface, and they, he heard John uh, Martin Luther's writings on the just shall live by faith, he believed not because of the scripture he memorized, not because of the songs he sang, not because of his ministerial credentials. He believed, and he says, my heart was strangely warmed, and the witness of the Spirit came. He got born again. Our grandparents came from, from, from Romania or Moldova or Ukraine or wherever you're from, and here we are. We're just trying to live our best life. We're just trying to soak up the summer sun and now get our, get our fall season pumpkin spice and flannel shirt. Just We're just trying to hang out. We're trying to go to another conference and stay up until 4 in the morning and having a good time around. We're just trying to, we're just trying to live through. And God said, no, I called you to a season just, just, just for such a time as this. Robert, who, what are we going to do? We, we don't invite Non-Romanians? Why would they come into our services? Because you know the fear of the Lord. And because when the storm starts raging against your life, they say, when everyone else is shrieking and screaming, there's something of a song still in your spirit. Some of you don't have peace even in easy times in your life. You have to drown out your anxiety and TikTok and social media and every other Netflix series just to distract yourself from the fact that there's a storm on the inside. Christ has come as he did in his own storm to rebuke the wind and waves. He speaks to storms in our inside and says, you can have peace on the inside no matter what you're going through. And that peace will be the witness of the Spirit to others that are going through the storms of this world. That if you can survive hell on earth and still have the glory of God inside of you, then we can make it. Do y'all want to help me on the, on the instruments, get ready to worship and come to the altar? I told you I've never preached this, this exact message anywhere, but I, I couldn't get away from it today to declare to you what the Bible says. They asked Jesus in Matthew 24 and also in Mark chapter 13. I'll read it for you from Mark. It should be on the screen possibly as well. In verse 4, Jesus they ask, they ask him, they say, tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? Verse 5, and Jesus answering them began to say, hear it, take heed lest any of you, any man be deceived. For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in diverse places. And there shall be famines and troubles. And these are the beginning of sorrows. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils. And in the synagogue ye shall be beaten. And ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake and for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate. Whatsoever ye shall be given in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but it is the Holy Ghost. 
Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not. I'm going to come down. Verse 20. And accept that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. And then if any man shall say to you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. For false Christs and false prophets shall arise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce. And if it were possible, even the elect. But take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. One of my favorite preachers, missionary Dick Brogdon, he juxtaposes these conditions with the latter thing that Jesus says in Matthew 24 of what will happen in these times. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness and then the end shall come. I don't need y'all to holler amen, but at least lift your eyebrows like you're kind of interested in what I'm talking about. Would you tune in just for a few more moments? Are you still there? Glory to God. Look this way. Jesus said, famine, pestilence, sword, nations, wars, hated, the love of many waxing cold, fathers against sons, brother against brother. And in the midst of all that, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness, and then the end shall come. He said, if you were to put it in chronological, or if you were to, to lace it and weave it all together, it would sound like this. And this gospel, nation rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, of the kingdom, famine, pestilence, earthquakes, and diverse places, shall be preached, and you shall be hated of all nations. As a witness, fathers against sons, brothers against brothers, in all the world. And then the end shall come. We are privileged to be living in the last days. We have an assignment. Nobody's lived in a 7.9 billion population earth ever in the history of this world. But we do. It took John Wesley months to get from England to Georgia. It takes me 12 hours to get from Atlanta to Nigeria. 12 hours. You can have an international ministry from your, from your couch online. We live in an incredible day. But how are you surviving the storm you're in now? Do you have the witness of the Spirit? Has He breathed into your life? Know that the things that are coming, they're the things that our brothers and sisters have faced since the beginning. Paul said, five times I received 40 lashes, save one of the Jews, beaten with rods twice, stoned, left for dead, a night and a day in the deep. This is who we are. Sawn asunder. This is the witness that will fill our lungs in these last days. I'm not even adequate to preach this message to you because I was raised in soft times. But I do know this, if it's coming, then God is going to prepare us. I refuse to hear from Christy. I refuse to hear from John. I refuse to hear from the pastors that are here. Pastor Bora, Pastor Adi, the storm came and we lost them. No, Paul said, the angel of the Lord said, fear not, none shall be lost. You may lose stuff. You may lose comfort. You may have to throw everything that's not attached to Christ overboard. But if you hold on to him, you don't have to live in fear. You can be filled with faith. There's going to come wars and we're going to preach the gospel. 
There's going to come famines, and we're going to preach the gospel. There's going to be earthquakes and pestilence and plagues in diverse places, and we're going to preach the gospel. And something worse than COVID might come, and we're going to preach the gospel. And nations may hate us, and we're going to preach the gospel. Hallelujah. Amen. We're not going to hide in some kind of emotional numbness that says chill out. And we're not going to rant and rave like all those that are demon-possessed. We are going to stand with the abiding peace of God while hell on earth is, is coming across the land and the antichrist is on his way i believe in the rapture i'm a pre-tribber i'm going in the first load but friend it's going to get dark before he gets here and we have the privilege to be those that declare the king is coming the king is coming let it be said of us when the storm overwhelms everyone else they heard us singing through it hallelujah they heard the testimony of those that had the peace of god glory to god Glory to God. I wonder, I don't know just exactly what paradise was like before Jesus ascended. You know, Old Testament paradise, Abraham's bosom. I don't know exactly what it was like, but I do wonder, because Moses was disqualified from going into the promised land, I wonder if when Joseph went in, conquered the land, got to experience all of it, I wonder if when Joseph finally died, if, if Moses saw him in paradise and said, Joshua, what was it like? I lived to bring God's people into that. Tell me, what was it like? Maybe Joshua said, oh, Moses, Pastor Moses, you should have been there. Houses we did not build, vineyards that we did not plant. You remember that? You remember that, that cluster of grapes that we had to put on a staff and carry by two men? I had a backyard full of them. You should have been there. Caleb, 85, was killing giants on his mountain. It was awesome. You should have been there. God made the sun stand still for us. We defeated our enemies. We, we took the promise. Oh, Pastor Moses, I wish you could have been there. I think Moses would have said, I wish I could have been there too. But I disobeyed God. I was disqualified. I don't know what paradise was exactly like, but I do know that it was in the heart of David to build a temple for God. And Nathan came and prophesied and said, you're disqualified, but your son Solomon will do it. And so David didn't live to see it. But I wonder if when Solomon finally died, if in paradise somewhere David came up to his son Solomon and said, tell me, what was it like? Oh, I can imagine Solomon saying, you should have been there, Dad. On the day we inaugurated it, we had the choir of the Levites, the trumpeters trumpeting. We had the singers singing. We were making sacrifice. We didn't even light the altar. Fire came from heaven and burnt the sacrifices. And while we're worshiping, a cloud descended. And every, every, we couldn't even stand to minister. It was awesome. They came all the way from Africa to see the glory of God that was abiding at the temple. You should have been there, Dad. So what, Robert? What, what, what does that matter for us? Oh, you don't know? Well, maybe you'll find out when you get to heaven. I don't know exactly what heaven will be like. But I wouldn't be surprised if somebody comes up to you and says, Hey, what's your name? When, when did you live? Oh, the rapture took place when you were 18 years old? Jesus returned when, when you were 17 years old? You never even graduated high school, did you? Your greatest day was before college, before your 20s, before your 30s, you were in the last days. Can I ask you, what was it like? What do you mean, what was it like? I was just chilling. I was just living my life. I was angry because they got my order wrong at the store. I mean, what do you mean? Who are you? I don't know what heaven's going to be like, but I wouldn't be surprised if somebody says, my name's Joel. I wish I could have been there, but I, I couldn't instead. I just saw it in the spirit and God told me to write of you and I saw it and I wrote it down that in the last days saith God that's when you lived right the last days and God told me to write down of you in the last days I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy and old men will dream dreams and young men will see visions and on servants and on handmaidens in those days will I pour out of my spirit and they shall prophesy you lived in the greatest generation you lived in the outpouring of the last days right before the coming of christ i prophesied but i wish i could have been there what was it like 
what was it like to walk the halls of your high school and be able to pray in the Holy Ghost and speak to your friend in third period chemistry and not even know in the natural but in the spirit hear the Lord say they're contemplating suicide speak to them they don't have to take their life I have a purpose for what was it like to experience the storm of politics the storm of religion the storm of prejudice but on the inside you had the peace of the Holy Ghost and you could stand through it all I don't know what you want to be able to say but I don't want to have to say well I went to church and I stood and I knelt and I sat and I sang and I left and I just went about my life I want to be able to say Joel you should have been there we saw the we went to this one youth conference and they got this they got this sweating, screaming, southern preacher. We didn't even really like the way he preached. We just, you know, we just put him up, up with him. He didn't like that we never said amen. We were kind of bored with him. But all of a sudden, we just started praying and saying, maybe God wants to fill us with the Holy Ghost. Maybe, maybe the word of God is right that there's coming a storm, and we need to be first filled with what they had in the storm of the upper room. We need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, while we started seeking God, what you prophesied, Joel, it happened to me. Oh, that fire came and filled my life that mighty rushing wind filled my heart and I had boldness to stand in hell on earth of the last days and I saw loved ones come to Christ and I was persecuted for his name but I didn't bend and I didn't bow and I never gave up hallelujah and while others were addicted and others were put in jail and others suffered all the horrors of sin I made it I endured to the end Stand with me to your feet, if you would, please. There's a storm coming. That's nothing new. We were born for the storm. We were born in the storm of the upper room as the church. We've survived every storm throughout generations. Some of your, your pastors, even that are still alive today, survived imprisonment and beatings. Our storm is coming. I don't want to wait till I'm in the middle of the tornado of my life before I start asking God for what he provided for me not just to survive, but for me to live the purpose and the assignment of God in these last days. I believe God called us inspired the leadership of this 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 gathering for this moment to say feel me now if you wait till you're in temptation with your girlfriend and there's nobody around and there's no accountability you didn't prepare it's too late if you wait till you have un, unaccountable access to the internet and, 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 and lustful desires hit you and there's there's no one checking up on you friend you didn't prepare it's too late if you didn't ask the fire of God to be deposited in your life and there comes a day that you are given the opportunity to compromise so that you're not persecuted, you don't lose your job, you're not made fun of by your friends, and you didn't determine in advance, God, you said I would be hated. You said there's, a, there's opposition coming. Prepare me. Fill me now. How can you not predetermine what you're going to say in that day but speak by the Holy Ghost if you're not filled with the Holy Ghost before that day? Oh, what a divine opportunity. The waves are going to overflow. But we're going to keep singing through it all. <sighs> Hallelujah. I'm going to invite you tonight to come and seek the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Robert, you've not said anything about speaking in tongues. And don't you know you need to explain all of that? Friend, if the Holy Ghost comes, tongues will come. Nobody in the upper room was given a tutorial on how to speak in tongues. Nobody in Acts 8 in Samaria, nobody in Acts 9, nobody in Acts 10 in the middle of the preaching they started speaking in tongues. Nobody in Acts 19 was raised in a, a Pentecostal church. They all had non-Pentecostal backgrounds. The Spirit came and they spoke as God gave the utterance. I'm not worried about tongues, friend, because it's more than a prayer language. It is the power of heaven on earth filling your life. If you come and receive, I believe you will have the Bible evidence of speaking in tongues. But don't come seek tongues. Come seek the word of the Lord that says, fill me with the power of Christ to be a witness in these last days. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. 
both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Lord, I've done my best tonight to deliver my heart to these people. I know our, our cultures are different and there's, there's obstacles to, to hearing and there's distractions of, of, of all sorts, but I pray that the Spirit of God would be able to, to divide through all of that with scalpel precision of a surgeon. Spirit of God, you would slice through every distraction, every every facade, every mask, every front, every religious personality that's been lifted up, every numbness that has said it's not that serious, chill out. God, would you slice through it all? Would you allow the prophetic utterance of Christ that said in the last days it will be like this and the unction of the Holy Ghost rise up and say, but you are going to take my gospel. Father, if we have not the witness of the Spirit within us, we must be filled tonight. We have no promise of future decades. We need your glory in our midst now. If you're here tonight and you're, you're saying, Robert, I, I, I need to be prepared, not, not for persecution of imprisonment, just for the storm that your family may experience next year. The storm your friends are experiencing now. I don't need the gift of prophecy to know there are people in your friend group battling suicidal thoughts. There are people in your friend group that will be tempted with substance abuse. There's people in your friend group that are already contemplating going to the next party and taking a drink because it's not that big a deal no, what the pa no matter what the pastor and the preacher says. And you must have something more deposited in you to say, I'm going to be a witness, I'm going to be a light, and I'm going to be, a, I'm going to be a, one who carries revival in my generation if that's what you want more than tongues but the infilling of fire and boldness to stand in the storm that's coming if that's what you desire tonight would you come fill these altars would you come and find a place stand kneel however you feel comfortable come now come now I'm not just asking those that have never been filled with the Holy Ghost if you've spoken in tongues all for the last 10 years you were filled very young but you say I need to be filled fresh with power and boldness to face the things the oppositions of these last days I need fresh revival in my soul if that's you step out and come into this altar now now come 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 on begin to step out of where you are hallelujah let's fill these altars let's fill these altars oh God we want more of you hallelujah hallelujah Baptize me fresh, Lord. Fill me fresh, Lord. Come if your friends aren't coming. Just make up your mind. I want more than, than church services, more than ceremonies. God, I need to be filled with you. I need to be filled with your glory. Oh, hallelujah. I was born for days like this. I was born for these last days. God, prepare me. Prepare me to burn for you. Hallelujah. 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 As they begin to lead us in a song, I pray that another 20 or 30 of you would have the boldness to step out of your seat, even if you're a leader or a pastor, whoever you are, and say, God, prepare us. Prepare us for what's on the horizon. Prepare us. Fill us with your glory in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Pastors, if you want to help us, pray for these that are here.
worship you. I worship you. Cause you are the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. Stop. 
work Help us to see what you're doing tonight Help us to feel what you're doing tonight stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you work even when i don't feel it you working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working
Jesus. Hallelujah. The Bible says there were 120 in the upper room. And it didn't say 10 of them got filled with the Holy Ghost. It didn't say 50 of them got filled with the Holy Ghost. 120 were there and 120 got filled with the Holy Ghost. Robert, you already gave your altar call. If you know Robert Martin, I have an aggressive Holy Ghost. One pastor had me back for revival every year for like 10 years. I said, have another evangelist. You don't have to have me. He said, I have you for one reason. You don't take no for an answer. Friend, if there's anything standing between you and receiving a fresh infilling of God, I'm willing to go to war with that thing until it gets out of the way and your heart is open and you say, I want to be in the 120. I don't want one or two to be filled tonight. I want 100% of those that are awake and alive to receive the fullness of what Jesus died for you to have. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you put one hand on your chest or one hand on your heart, one, just one hand on your abdomen? Would you lift your other hand up to the air? Just listen to me very briefly while your hand is on your heart and your other hand is in the air. Look at me and listen to me. We're about to pray. This is the truth of our, of our, of our life. I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body. Your spirit, man, is what died because of sin and came back to life because of the gospel. Your soul is the place of the mind, the will, and the emotions of the making decisions. It's the place of feeling. And your body, you know what that is? It's not eternal. It will be glorified. And... But hear me. When God fills you with the Holy Ghost, it's not about necessarily praying louder. It's not physical. It's not what happens to the body. It's not soulish. It's not your emotions becoming more intense. Some of you need the Spirit of God to be like a river through you. And you think that means becoming more emotional. The Spirit of God may overflow and splash into your emotions. But hear me. You don't have to feel, shake, cry. It's, the God is bigger than feelings. But if you will let God feel your spirit tonight, He will move and course through your entire being. There will be moments you're tempted and you're not shaking under the power of God. You're not crying tears in His presence and you need the Holy Ghost to quicken you. That's what this moment is for. Every Pentecostal service ought to be a laboratory of preparation for the real world. So whether you came to this altar or not, I want you to begin to prepare yourself now for every storm of temptation, of compromise, of the pressure of the world, the flesh, and the devil. I'm not asking you to pray loud with emotions. I'm not asking you to stir up a feeling. I am asking for the Spirit of God to fill you until it overflows into all that you are. Hallelujah. With one hand in heaven and one hand on your heart, God, we ask for this generation. It's not a casual moment. We're not asking for the ceremony of religion. But God, we're asking for the very real Holy Ghost that filled your church in the upper room. The veil was rent in the temple. God, you violently came out to fill your people and to prepare them for the days that were ahead. God, should you tarry, some of us may be martyred for your glory. Should you tarry, some of us will come under great suffering in the days ahead. Lord, the enemy has a bullseye on a target on every life to take them out through sin, compromise, and temptation. But right now, Lord, we surrender to you. And right now, God, we say, make this moment the upper room of North Carolina. Make this house, God, the upper room of this state, of this region. For such a time as this, we're not our grandfathers. We're not Richard Vernbrand. We are us. We are here. We are now. We are not Billy Graham. God, we are us. And we receive the blood to wash us of our sin. And we receive the wind of your spirit. And we receive tongues of fire. And we receive a baptism of the Holy Ghost with your hand lifted. Lord, would you, would you cause every young person in this room to receive a faith and a trust right now to yield to you. In the name of Jesus, my brother, my sister, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Oh, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. We sang tongues of fire. We sang tongues of fire. Come, Lord, we say to the inner man, receive the endowment of power from on high. 
the inner man be built up in your most holy faith praying in the Holy Ghost be filled be filled every young woman be filled every young man be filled from the sound booth to the platform receive ye the Holy Ghost hallelujah hallelujah let your spirit man overflow let your spirit man overflow come on young men come on young women receive boldness receive the Holy Ghost with speaking in tongues but beyond tongues receive the spirit of peace and joy and boldness and fire the quickening of the Lord right now right now open your spirit be filled be filled God you've called us for such a time as this equip us equip us oh Lord hallelujah young people can I challenge you to lift up a prayer for just how about 120 seconds two solid minutes could you begin to pray out loud go go right now lift your voice lift your voice lift your voice lift your voice hallelujah just in just for a moment band would y'all just fall out a little bit brother John would y'all just let the voices rise for a moment y'all can come back in in a moment come on lift your voice young women Lord give us boldness God give us boldness every middle schooler every high schooler every young lady every timid every shy every bashful person fill us with the Holy Ghost and boldness fill us with the Holy Ghost and fire you don't have to scream but don't whisper open your mouth and make a declaration Lord we surrender to you our vessel tonight we surrender our vessel tonight receive ye the Holy Ghost receive ye the Holy Ghost be filled be filled God you filled them in Acts 2 you refilled them in Acts 4 you filled them in Acts 19 fill us tonight Holy Ghost and fire Holy Ghost and fire. Holy Ghost and fire. Holy Ghost and fire. God, nothing less than fire. Nothing less than revival. Nothing less than a burning for the glory of Christ. Lord God, nothing less. Nothing less, Lord. We yearn for you. We long for you. We ache for your glory. Hala Maria Shatala Labokosaya. Oh, our lost loved ones need you. Oh, our classmates need you. Our teammates need you. Our brothers and sisters need you. Our churches need you. Oh, God, they need fire. Burn in us. Burn in us for Christ. Burn in us for the nations. Burn in us for the lost. If the world's going to become more demon-possessed, then God, let your church become more Holy Ghost-possessed. Possess us by your Spirit. Possess us by your spirit. Come on, 30 more seconds. Ask God for personal revival. Come on, ask God if nobody else receives it. Lord, let me have a one man, one woman revival tonight. Hallelujah. Make me a witness, Jesus. Pour it out. Let your love run over. Here and now. Let your glory fill this house. Pour it out. Let your love run over.
of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say.
as we all go through storms, as many times that I went through my storms and I've always come to the same conclusion. Lord, I don't know how unbelievers do it. Am I the only person here who, who comes to the same conclusion? Like, how do they go through life? How do they do it? I don't, I don't know. Somewhere in Ecclesiastes, I can't remember the, the chapter and verse, but it says that the oppressed, I looked at the oppressed, and they have no comforter. No comforter. There's no comforter for them. Do you know in the New Testament who Jesus calls the comforter? The Holy Spirit. He's called the comforter. And, and us, the children of God, we have the comforter. So when trials and hard times come, there's peace. And I don't understand it, but there's peace. There's greatness. There, there, there's peace because of the comforter. There's peace because of the comforter. There's boldness because of the comforter. And do you know how strong this comforter is? Do you know what it says in the Thessalonians? In, in, in Thessalonians? It says that he's the restrainer of the man of lawlessness. He holds back the Antichrist. Now let me say that again. Now this same spirit lives in you. The same spirit lives in you. Do you, under, do you imagine that? Sometimes we come in the presence of God defeated. <laughs> lost. And we have this great power inside of us that holds back the Antichrist. And I want to encourage you guys tonight. Take a hold of this power. Hold, hold fast to it. Hold fast to it. And I pray that this greatness, this great power fills every single person in this place. Not just the one-time experience. Acts 4. The apostle says, Consider their threats and enable your servants to preach the word of God with more boldness. And you know what happened next? They prayed. And you know what happened next? The room shook. And they were filled again with the power of God. It is, a, it, it, is, it is a process, it's a way of life. It's not a one-time thing. It's power, it's greatness, it's identity, it's, it's all of that into one. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's a thought process, it's not just you, it's a process, it's how you think. When you come in alignment with the Spirit of God, the Bible says that you can have the deep thoughts of God. How? Through the Holy Spirit. A mere human can have the deep thoughts of God. <laughs> I just want to bow, bow our heads and, 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 and just end with this prayer. Father God, first of all, I want to just give you the glory. The Word of God says, not by power, not by strength, but by your spirit. And Lord God, I pray that tonight it is a humbling moment for every single person in this place. Let us not take the results of tonight upon us, Father. No. Let you receive all the glory and all the praise and all the honor and all the worship. Let it be yours alone, Jesus. And I pray, Lord God, that you will fill this community, Lord God. It doesn't matter who's, uh, who's, who belongs to Apollos, who belongs to Paul. We're all Christ's first. And I pray that tonight we have the same mindset. We come under the authority and the headship of Jesus Christ, Father. And would you continue to bless our community, Father. And by putting us a fire, a fire, for the, for the living God, a fire to evangelize our communities, to go beyond the Romanian language, Father. The Word of God says, make disciples of all nations. In Christ, there's no Romanian, no American, no black, no Hispanic, no man, no woman. Christ, you are the greatest equalizer. And I pray that we understand that tonight, Lord God. And let this be a process of growth that will happen in our community, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Um, I just want to say a special thank you for John 
and uh, his brother Benny and Nathan on keys and everybody. I mentioned them specifically because they came from out of town. Um, so bless you guys. May God continue to use you guys and whatever in, in all you guys do. I was gonna say whatever, but I know you, what you guys do. But in all you guys do, and thank you for everybody who stepped up and, and who served and who helped and assisted. May God bless you guys in a profound way. And uh, I pray for all the pastors tonight that came, Pastor Benny, Pastor uh, Adi, Pastor Marius. May God bless everything you guys do, your families, your churches, every single department that lacks, let it flourish in the season, in Jesus' name. And uh, guys, uh, the fellowship doesn't have to end. Um, there's food in the back. We can continue the fellowship there. And may God bless every single one of you. Amen.